how good and faithful our God is. Oh, it is so good to see you all here this morning. Silence. It is so good to see you all here this morning. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad to be back in church? Amen. Amen. I am grateful for the blessing of the Lord. Three months that we've been watching from live stream. That's a long time. And I know we have a number joining us on the live stream, but we want you to know that we're grateful you're with us and a happy Sabbath to you. I long for the day in heaven when we can all come back together with no fear of a disease or anything else that would separate us. Mm. God is good. We had a, a good group here this morning, and the Lord really blessed in our worship service then, and we have a good group here for the second service. My wife was here for the first, and she stayed through to the beginning of the second, so some of you got to see Chloe. This is her first Sabbath in church, which was just awesome. I love being a dad. I love being a dad. All you dads out there, you know what I'm talking about. Well, as we begin, we're going to be diving into 1 Corinthians 13, but I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me and ask the Lord to guide us as we open his word. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be able to come and worship together. It reminds us of what our sister Christians brothers and sisters who are in other countries, I think of those in China or North Korea or in the Middle East, who are persecuted or know their life is on the line if they worship. Thank you that we can worship together here. As we open your word, as we study these sacred pages, I ask that you will send your spirit and angels to fill and to speak through me and to each heart individually, that we may leave with a deeper appreciation of Jesus and a greater love for him and for each other. In Christ's name, amen. We're taking a pause, as we have for the last couple of weeks, on our Great Controversy series. We'll pick that up again next week and finish going through the chapters of Great Controversy. Which, by the way, I don't know about you, but I've thoroughly enjoyed studying through the Great Controversy together. It has been very powerful. Uh, for myself as I've been studying through it. And I've heard from a number of you that you've really been blessed as we've gone through it as well. So we will get back to that. But today, I wanted to take some time to look at, the Lord laid the burden, I should say, on my heart, to look at some of the issues we're facing in our society right now. So I want you to take your Bible and go with me to John chapter 14. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of strong opinions in our society right now. I don't think I need to tell anybody that if you were to start a conversation, uh, take something as as simple as, um, dare I say, face masks, you can get very heated conversations going with people that before all of COVID-19 probably wouldn't have had a strong opinion one way or the other, but now we have strong opinions. And and I'm just using that as an example. You could use any number of examples. You could talk about um, what, what... what the founding of this country and the pieces that happened there in church, I'll pause for a moment and I'll say, we have a deep stain at the beginning of this country that I think we're going to be reaping the consequences of for a long time. There's a lot of division right now in our country, in our culture. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of fear. As we go to John chapter 14, Christ is there in the upper room with his disciples. He's just washed their feet. That happened earlier in the chapter. And I'm guessing what's weighing on his mind is what's going to happen to this church after he goes back to heaven. Because you know what Satan wanted to do to that early church? I don't need to tell you. You can know. He wanted to squash it through every means possible, right there at the beginning. They were, after Christ's death, just a few days later, starting to buy into some of what was happening. They were afraid. They were hiding out in the upper room. Fear was gripping them. They were divided away. They were separated from the mission that God had given them. There was 
um, anxiety about the future. And, and so Christ, right at the outset of the mission of the disciples to take the gospel to the world, lays out the foundational principle of what happens and what is the basis of everything that takes place in heaven. So, I know you're there in John chapter 14. Give the preacher a moment to catch up with you all. John chapter 14. And the pages never turn fast enough when you're up front. Uh, I apologize. I meant John 13, verses 34 and 35. And when you're there, if you let the preacher know by saying amen. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Notice what Christ says. A new commandment I give to you that you what? Did he say a new option I give you? A new idea that you can think about and process in your own home and decide if you want to do it or not? No, what does Christ say? A new what? A commandment I give you that you what? Love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You know the answer to this question. If you were to summarize the Ten Commandments into one word, what would that word be? Love. The very foundation of the government of God is summarized in one word, love. In fact, if we understood love properly, we would never have needed, I believe, the Ten Commandments spelled out. Because all the commandments describe is what love to God looks like. No other gods. Worshipping a whole day with Him, etc. And what love to our fellow man looks like. Honoring your parents, not stealing, not lying, etc., etc. That's all they're describing is what love looks like. And so God lays out here, Christ lays out, look, he's telling his disciples, you've missed the focus. I want you to understand that at the foundation of what you're called to do, at its core is to love every single person you come in contact with. Now, how, how relevant was this to the disciples? Well, on their way into that upper room, the disciples had been arguing. Does anybody remember what they had been arguing about? Who was the what? The greatest. Now, we may not actually get into an argument about who's the greatest. But, but it, is, it is likely that we might get into discussions on various ideas. And, and a form of I am greater than you can take I know facts better than you. I know what's going on better than you do. And you better listen to what I'm saying because this is critical. Now, church, there's nothing we actually should have good discussions on what's going on. But in the context of those, we must never forget that my brother or my sister that I'm talking to is a child of the king of the universe. And they should know from the way we talk to them that the love of Christ is shining from us to them. You understand what I'm saying? Did people, when you talked to them this last week, know Christ's love was shining through you. Did your family, now let's take this closer to home, did my family know the love of Christ? Not when I was getting along with them, but when there was a time when I disagreed, did they see the love of Jesus shining through me? Why is this so important? Verse 35. By this, read it out loud with me. By this, what's the next word? All will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How does the world know that we're the disciples of Jesus Christ? Because we have love. So if we're missing this ingredient of love in our church and in our actions with each other, in our homes, in our spouses, if we're missing this, we're not telling the world that we're the disciples of Christ. I don't think there could really be a more important thing for us to be talking about right now in a society where there is so much deep-seated division. We need to be the, the force of change that points out a way to bring love and unity back. So what does love look like? How does love work? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Someone's probably already guessed 
that that's where we were headed. I think I may have said it at the beginning as well. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and for the remainder of our time here, we're just going to take a few verses and work through them. We won't make it through the whole chapter. I wish we could, but there's just too much to talk about to make it all the way through the chapter. Paul here, talking about unity in diversity and unity in diversity of gifts there in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. In your own time, you can read chapter 12. It's a great precursor and helps you understand the, the background of what Paul's getting to. Paul's talking about unity. He's talking about how we're all one body in Christ. And though we all may be different functions and different perspectives, we are one in Christ. In that background, he comes into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he says this. Let's start in verse 1. He's laying the treatise for the importance of love. And this one, I think he directed straight at preachers. So let's start by preaching to myself. How's that sound? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not what? I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. You may be the world's most eloquent speaker, but if the love of Christ is not constraining what you say, if you don't live the life of love outside of the pulpit, if I don't live the life of love outside of here or outside of my conversations with you, then what does Paul say? I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. When I was a kid, I think mom... This is one of the things that frustrated, probably bothered my mom the most. We'd get the pots and pans and put them up in the kitchen. You ever did that when you were a kid? Or did you ever have kids that did that? Hmm. Uh, and you'd set them all up and you'd start banging them and the different sizes would make different noises. And I'd set up my drum set and, and then I would start going at it. And then my sister would join me and then my mom would come in about going crazy and it would all stop. But that's what Paul says we sound like when we get up and we speak or we're talking in conversation, but we don't live what we're talking. I think one of the most sobering examples of someone who is a powerful orator but didn't carry the love of Christ with him is found in the story of Herod. You'll find it in Acts chapter 12 and verses 20 through 22. It's a very sobering story and it's a reminder that the way we live must be carried with love. Acts chapter 12 verses 20 through 22. When you're there, if you'd let the preacher know by saying amen. You know how nice it is to hear pages turning while you're speaking? Oh, it's wonderful. Herod is, this is not the Herod that killed Christ. This is, I believe, his son. He was um, angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and uh, they didn't like to have the king angry with them. So they come and they start trying to do obeisance to him and bring everyone back together. Herod had a gift. He was a powerful orator. He would not have been a preacher, but he was a gifted speaker. And when he would speak, he was able to, as far as I can tell, hold people in the palm of his hands. Now, of course, they also had an incentive to make him think he was a great orator. But from what I can tell, he was also a gifted speaker. So we pick up the story in verse 20. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord. And having made bless, um, Blastus, the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in purple apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. It must have been a speech that everyone enjoyed. Have you ever listened to a speaker? And I love a gifted speaker. I think of Sean Boonstra, John Bradshaw. There's a number of them. And, and it's like you're sitting there and, and they hold you on the edge of your seat all the way through the story, all the way through the sermon. And by the time you're done, you've been moved through the different emotions of the Bible passages and the different areas that are being brought out. I think of another gifted orator, this one who did great damage with his gift. Hitler was a gifted orator. You know, he moved tens, hundreds of thousands in his audience. But he moved them for evil, not for good. So here's Herod. He's up there. He's speaking, people are moving, and the people begin to shout, the voice of a God and not a man. 
Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not what? Give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. It's a terrible way to die. My grandfather was a missionary in the Far East. And he saw a man who died from worms eating him alive. Horrible way to die. Very painful. That's what Herod went through. Because he was a gifted orator minus the love of God. And, and I want to touch on this. This doesn't just apply to me as a pastor. As we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this applies to all of us in our conversations with others. If we speak what we don't live, we do more damage to the gospel than if we had said nothing at all. Are you with me? We need the love of Jesus Christ. What do you say? 1 Corinthians 13, back with me. Let's look at the next verse there. Paul is laying out the different areas that we may be tempted to think, well, because I'm gifted in this, the love of God doesn't have to be in my heart. But I would submit, church, if we do not show Christ's love in our homes and in our church, we are worse we need the grace of Christ to change us. Let me put it that way. Amen. Verse 2, notice what it says. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but I have not, what's that next word, church? I am what? Nothing. Without the love of Christ in our hearts, where what? Nothing. God has given us as a people incredible light. Do you realize how much God has given us as a church? We know what's going on right now, don't we? We know these are the final events before Jesus comes. We see the, the signs that soon we're going home. As we can pick up our series next week, finishing going through great controversy, the, the events that are, that are complex and difficult to unravel for the leaderships of our country and our state, we as Seventh-day Adventists, God has given us light to understand it. We know how to build a relationship with God. What a blessing we have from Jesus Christ. We understand the prophecies. If you go with me to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. The challenge that we have is that knowledge without love won't do you any good. What does the Bible say? Revelation 2, are you there? To the angel... Here's some pages turning. I'll give you a couple moments. This is the first message of the seven messages to church, the seven churches. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labors, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles or not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. God loves people who are faithful to his word. What do you say? I want to be faithful. How about you? But in the midst of being faithful... Don't become so focused on that that you lose the love of Christ in your heart. You become so focused on a point or an area of doctrine or something that, you've, that God has shown you, you need to do. And he's called you to do it. And you're like, okay, I'm God, I'm going to do it. But you know what happens when we're called to do something? It's like we become the conscience for everybody around us. Now, it's not wrong to share truth with people. That's what God calls us to do. But how you share it makes all the difference in the world. If you share truth without love so that they feel the compassion of Christ coming through you, you will do more damage to that truth than if you'd shared nothing at all. I shared a story in the first service. Um, my... And Rachel doesn't mind my oldest sister me sharing this story. When we were growing up, my oldest sister Rachel was about four years old. I think she was about four years old. Might have been five. 
And uh, she had been hearing about how we're supposed to witness and share the gospel. And she was all excited about this. And so it's Sabbath morning. She's outside waiting to go to church. And at this point, we lived in the neighborhood. And I think I'd just been born. Um, and the neighbor, who she built a good relationship with, is out mowing his lawn. Well, you're not supposed to do that on Sabbath. And Rachel knows this. So she goes over and he, of course, stops. So he's all excited to talk to the little neighbor daughter. And he stops and he's like, how are you doing? She goes, great. Why are you mowing your lawn on Sabbath? Don't you know you're not supposed to do that? My dad is mortified. He's like, what do I do? <laughs> so he goes over and he tries to smooth it over. But the point is, of course, a little child doing that, people are more compassionate to. But doing that didn't win anybody. We must never be ashamed of what we believe. Never be ashamed that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. We are gifted, but at the same time, always, not just out there, but inside this building and inside our family, let us share in love. There are some people that see this pandemic and think the thing is a whole waste of time. There are others who think it's very, very serious. We need to have love and respect for where people are at. I have a personal opinion on it, but that doesn't change how I view either side. Are you with me? Church, we're family. It's okay to see it a little differently. God created us differently. He loves diversity. Now, when it comes to doctrinal issues, we need God to bring us unitedly together. But on some of these non-moral issues, church, don't get into an argument over it. Let God lead people to where they should be. Respect where they're at. It's okay. Are you with me? So what happened with these people? They got focused on truth and they left their first love. What does Christ say? Go back with me to Revelation chapter 2. Let's finish this. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you. Are you with me? You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the what work? First work, or else I'll come to you and quickly remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you, what's that word? Repent. God is calling us to turn back. There is a time, it's not just to say, oh, I'm sorry, I said it that way. God is calling us to turn around. And church, I'll tell you this right up front. You can't put that love in your heart. It has to come on your knees before God. But if you ask him, his love will fill you and you'll be transformed by his grace. And we will become the church that is known as the place of love. Compassion, faithful to God's word, unswerving in our integrity for following him, but gracious and how we carry it out. Trust me, I need this sermon any, probably more than anyone else here because I tend to speak things very straight, but God is changing me. What do you say? And he's giving me, and he's continuing to because I need more of it, the ability to love indifferently. Okay, let's get back to 1 Corinthians. We're almost done. We just want to look at a couple of other points here as we come down to the landing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We've talked about what love is not. Love doesn't, if you are a great speaker but you don't have love, you're not going to do, it doesn't do you any good. If you understand prophecy and all of those things and the truths of God's word but you don't have love, it's not going to do you any good. If you have faith to remove mountains, but you don't have love, you're nothing, according to Paul. Verse 3 says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. If you are a martyr for Jesus Christ, but you're an angry martyr or a hateful martyr, you're just as lost as if you had not given your life. Are you with me? We must show, even when we're persecuted, that we love Jesus with all our heart. What does this look like? What is love? Verse 4 is the definition. 
I believe, of what love looks like. It's what we find God doing. It's what we find the universe doing to save this planet. Verse 4, love suffers, what's the next word? Long and is kind. Think of what God has gone through to save this planet. For over 6,000 years, the heart of God has been broken over the evil and the pain that sin has brought to our planet. You see this in Genesis chapter 6. Go there with me if you would briefly. The, the, the heartache of God over the pain of this planet. Verse 6 of Genesis 6. I, I don't know even in eternity if we'll ever understand the depth of the grief that the Godhead has gone through for the brokenness of humanity. Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. God is is pained, and yet God hasn't given up on man. For 6,000 years he suffered through this, this horrible experiment of sin. You come down 4,000 years and you see God the Father sending His Son in Christ. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Christ comes in the likeness of a man. He humbles Himself all the way down and He shows that when you love somebody, you're willing to suffer to show that person compassion and care and love. Philippians chapter 2, when you're there, if you'd say amen. Notice Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 6, what it says. Um, Philippians chapter 5 and 2 and verse 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider Robert to be equal with God. Verse 7, but made himself of what kind of reputation? No reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Church, love looks like that. It means that you will do whatever it takes to win and to show compassion to the person you're talking to. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Husbands, I want to talk to you for a moment. This concept of love is the antithesis of how our society is oriented right now. Our society is oriented on me first, my desires first, what I'm feeling, and my rights. This love says your desires, your needs, and your rights come ahead of mine. And men, God is looking for husbands and fathers who are willing to put their own desires aside and give to win and love their wives and their spouses. And we need men who will do this. I am being called by God to be a man like that, and so are you. You know, some people will say, well, it, it, They may not say this publicly, but they might think it. If my wife just hadn't have done this or this, I wouldn't be upset with her. Church, there's a lot we do that should upset God. Don't you know that? You know how often God should just walk away from me? How many times I've blown it, and yet God suffers and comes back and comes back, and he says, I want to win you, I want to love you, I want to save you. Husbands, How you respond is your choice, not your wife's. Wives, how you respond is your choice, not your husband's. You understand what I'm saying? I like to blame other people for how I feel. But God has given me the ability to change how I, to look on him and allow him to change how I feel. We've become a society that blames other people when we don't feel the way we want to. But God needs to change our hearts where we allow Him to change us 
so that we always reflect him no matter how we are treated. I know this isn't popular. It's absolutely against what is drilled into us by our culture from the time we're small all the way up. But it is what Christianity looks like. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love, say it with me, suffers long and is what? Kind. I want that love. How about you? I want to finish that verse and then we'll move into our appeal. 1 Corinthians 13, go back there with me if you would. We need the mind of Christ. We need the life of Christ. He continues defining what love is. Love does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Say it with me. Love never fails. That's the love we need. You don't push your idea and your agendas. I've been very guilty of that often. I'll freely admit that up here, but God is changing my heart just like he's changing yours, right? He doesn't want me to push what I want. He wants us to go forward as a family and seek what he wants. And what I think he wants may not be what he wants, but through the collective, as we pray together, as we press together, and as we seek him together, God will make his will clear. In our families, we need to allow God to guide us and bring us together. And as he does, what a unity will come to the forefront. Church, I want to be that in my home. I know you want to be that in your home. And by the grace of God, may he transform us into new men and women that love like Christ does. What do you say? Hmm. Love is kind, suffers long. And his kind. One of my favorite stories from the Reformation is about a man by the name of Dirk Willems. He was an Anabaptist and was in a country where at that time it was illegal to baptize. He had found in the Bible, as he had studied it out, if someone either someone had studied with him or he had discovered it himself, that baptism by immersion is how we enter the fold of Christ. And so he began to share it with his family. He began to share it with his friends. He started baptizing people. The country got very upset. The religious and civil authorities said, hey, this is illegal. You can't do this. You've got to stop. They arrested him. And they took him to a castle and put him into a prison there up in one of the castle towers. I've been to that castle. If you've watched Light Unshackled, we filmed on location there. The castle's gone. All that's left is a moat around where the ruins were. It's... They've done some other building there, and I think they have a museum now. They just discovered it a year before we filmed. That's a whole other story. But Dirk Willems was up in this castle, and they, he figured out that if he tied his bed sheets together, they somehow hadn't figured out he would be able to get out the window, but he figured out, if I tie my bed sheets together, I can drop down. It's, it was in December. It was cold. I can drop down onto the ice of the moat, and I can run across the ice, and I can get to the woods, and I'll be able to get home back to my family, my children, and to the people that are here. In, in my life. So he does. It's the middle of the night. He ties his bed sheets together. He attaches it to the window. Actually, I think he attached it to a table inside. I don't remember that detail. Anyway, attaches it and he climbs down the bed sheets onto the ice. Because he had been in prison for some weeks, he had lost quite a bit of weight. He was quite light. And so he was able to make it across the thin ice. But as he was going, guards saw him. They started yelling. The alarm was raised. And so he, kept, he starts really moving. And one of the guards, who was much better fed, had more weight, and also had the armor that he was wearing on, takes off across the ice to catch Dirk. Unfortunately for the guard, he was too heavy for the ice in the middle. 
And right there, he, the ice cracked and he fell in. And he starts yelling for somebody to help him and to save him before he drowns in the icy, freezing waters. Dirk Willems hears him. He turns around and he sees that no other guard is going to come and save this man. You're in Dirk Willems' shoes. You know that if you turn around and save this guard, you're going to die. What would you do? Would you keep going and go back to your family and to your children? I know as a father now, this story takes on a new dimension. Would you go? Or would you go back and save this guard's life and seal your fate? What would you do? Well, Dirk... Remember what Christ had said, that you love your enemies and you do good to those who spitefully use you and abuse you. And he stopped. He turned around and he started carefully going back across the ice to where the guard had fallen through. He grabs the guard's arms and I'm guessing he must have laid out on the ice to keep from falling through himself with the extra weight, pulls the guard up, they make their way carefully back to the shore, and he's instantly rearrested. The guard did, to his credit, beg for them to let Dirk go, but they wouldn't. They took him from the castle to the church. I've been in the church where they held him. It's still standing. Took him up into the tower up in the church. I've been in the tower and on the floor that they believe he was held on. At the top of it had been bombed during World War II, but they've reconstructed it. They put him in shackle, um, in stocks, I should say, his feet in stocks. They have a pair of stocks there that I've had my feet in. And he was held there for months, very little food, freezing cold temperatures. It's January, February now. All from saving this guard's life. And then they led him down these very narrow, dark stairs that go round and round and round, back to the main ground. He was hauled off about four or 500 yards um, distant. They had a pile set up. He was tied to the stake and he was burned to death. Would you have gone back for that guard if you knew that was going to happen to you? What does Bible say? Love does what? Suffers long and is? Let's run through that again. Love, say it with me, suffers long and is kind. If the story stopped there, many of us would wonder if Dirk did the right thing. But based off the word of God, if that's where the story ended, he did the right thing. Church, are you with me? Are you with me? But the rest of the story, that man's death was the means of thousands of people turning their life towards Christ. It spread like wildfire. A sense of, of um, righteous indignation rose from the populace. This man turned back and saved this guard's life. How dare you kill him after the rematch? And God used it as the beginning of a movement. You see, that split-second decision to put the guard ahead of himself led to thousands more being saved. Who knows, husband or wife or child, in that split-second decision where you decide to put your parents, your, your spouse ahead of yourself, if it would not, will not be the means of saving a soul for Jesus Christ. Who knows, dear church member, if in the middle of a conversation you see starting to go into heated territory, that choice of yours to not respond emotionally, but to respond in love and kindness will not be the means of saving the person you're talking to. For you little know the challenges they've been facing. Put God first, last, and best. What do you say, church? What a powerful story and message about how we can love each other. Self-sacrificing love, esteeming others above ourselves. And the only way we can do that 
is if we have Jesus in our hearts and let that light shine out. So let's sing our closing hymn together. Would you stand with us, please? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light, then why should I fear? By day and by night, His presence is near. He is my salvation from sorrow and sin. This blessed persuasion the Spirit brings in. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, He leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, He skies where Jesus forever in glory doth reign. Then how can I ever in darkness remain? The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night He leads me along. The Lord is By day and by night, He leads me along. The Lord is my light, the Lord is my strength. I know in His might I'll conquer at length. My weakness in mercy He covers with power. And walking by faith, he upholds me each hour. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my all and in all. There is in His sight no darkness at all. He is my Redeemer, my Savior and King. With saints and with angels His praises I sing. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, He leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, He Can you hear me? There we go. God, your light today, I almost teared up hearing everyone sing together. Praise God. I have an appeal. How many of you want to ask God to put that love in your heart and that joy in how you live? Would you raise your hand with me? Love of Jesus Christ in our hearts. We want to treat others the way Jesus treats us. We want to be compassionate, understanding. We don't want to get into divisive conversations. But Father, instead, as Jesus would, lift up, yes, the truth, but in a way that wins people through love and compassion. 
Fill our church with your grace and your spirit, we pray. Fill our homes with the love of Christ. May we, as we leave this place, have Jesus in everything we do and say. Fill us with your spirit, we ask, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we play, the deacons are going to dismiss us from the back towards the front. I will be out in the parking lot so that we won't have any um, uh, congregating in the foyer to keep social distancing. God bless you. It's been so good to see you, and happy Sabbath. We have this call.